Hey everybody, I'm so excited that I have my friend Minda Hartz on the line. I like to call her an inclusion warrior. And if you aren't familiar with her book, The Memo, haven't read it yet, by the end of this podcast, you'll know why I call her that. She's an author and she is also an entrepreneur. Hey, Minda. Hey, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Michelle. I'm thrilled (laughs) that you're on here with me. You know, we've been passing each other here and there. You know, we were both on the roster out at the Texas Women's Conference in Austin and both very busy. You were speaking, I was speaking. We probably passed each other in the airport, maybe in the sky. Probably. (laughs) (laughs) Amanda, you've been busy. You've been coming and going like crazy. It's a blessing. I'm glad that people want to have these conversations that we've been ready to have for a long time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Minda, you know what? We have a moment called the culture soup moment. You know what it's all about. How about we go on and dive in? Let's do it. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So we see conversations about diversity and equity and inclusion. In fact, I joke all the time that some people think the diversity inclusion, all one word, diversity inclusion, right? (laughs) They don't know the difference. It's the thing to be talking about right now. But now... Thanks to a couple different studies, women in the workplace back in 2017, and then also Catalyst, which actually called out women of color and specifically black women and the issues that we face in the workplace. There are more voices like your own adding to this conversation about inclusion when it comes specifically to black women. How does that make you feel? Well, you know some of it is frustrating because I feel like the reports just say the same things each Mm -hmm. and every year, but we know that facts and numbers don't lie. Right. So it just allows us to have some facts to our feelings, right? Right. (laughs) We need both of it. So I appreciate the statistics because now we can go forward and have it in our hands and be like, see, we've been telling you. (laughs) Right. And you know what? I appreciate it too, because there are a lot of us who have felt this way, generation after generation, I mean, probably three or four generations deep in the workplace, especially corporate, some of those who broke the glass ceiling and even got inside. But because that feeling was not, um, what's the word, it wasn't reinforced, it wasn't validated or anything by anyone. And even when we got home to our families, they're like, buck it up, suck it up, right? (laughs) Go back in there and just put your head down and keep going. It's refreshing to so many of us to know that we've been at least seen. Absolutely. And I think we needed that. So even though the reports can be a little frustrating for things we already know, but at least it it lets us know that we weren't making these things up. So I, I think it's a good thing. Right. Good, good, good. So you've written this book. And it's called The Memo. For those of you that are out there that aren't familiar, I don't know, you've been under a rock or something, okay? It's a bestseller. And it's named after your company, right? Yes. And you want to tell us what The Memo LLC is all about? Yeah, so that's what a lot of people who are just now finding out about me, they think, oh, she has this book. But actually, in 2015, I started my company, The Memo, along with my co-founder, Lauren. And We provide career curriculum for women of color to help them prepare for their seat at the table. And so we've been doing that since 2015. So for all of you that wondered, this book didn't come out of anywhere. She (laughs) she just didn't pull it out of the sky. She's been putting some walk to her talk and now the book. So how did Minda, yes, Minda, is that the way you say it, come to the conclusion that after you know, having experiences all your own, listening to clients and such that you should put pen to paper. Yeah. Well, it's funny because I was expecting someone else to write the book, right? Mm. I had been sitting around waiting for somebody else, (laughs) someone who I thought, you know, was more seasoned than me, more experienced than me. And so I was waiting for someone to write the book and I just realized that, okay, like Toni Morrison said, write the book you want to read and things aligned. And I was able to do that. I wrote it in a voice in which And if you've read the book, then, you know, it's almost like you're sitting in my living room, like we're having this dialogue. And I wanted to kind of break the the glass, if you will, on the traditional career books, business books, and and use that that, um, pop culture vernacular along with business acumen to tell a different story. Right. Okay. So I wanted to go there. The voice of the book is very interesting because it seems that you have very much zeroed in on your audience. And how would you describe your audience? 
you know, it's funny because when I first wrote the book, I wasn't really sure who the audience would, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> who it would be for. But again, I wrote the book that I would want to read that right. would be like entertaining to me, but also serious. Right. Mm-hmm. But there's some hard topics in there. And so I thought it would probably be millennial ish. Right. That would probably like it or Gen X to a to a degree for some of the references. But what I found is being on book tour that I had boomers, I yes. had Gen Z, everybody was rocking with it and they felt it in their, in their spirit. And so I was happy to see that even if you were new to your career or you were more seasoned, that you saw yourself in some way, shape or form in this book. Absolutely. And you know, paragraph after paragraph, you see pop culture references to music. You, you can quote Janet Jackson, Biggie Smalls, <laughs> <laughs> the great prophet P. Diddy, yeah. all of that. And you know what? It's pretty um, relevant, too. You were able to talk about the Trump administration and, you know, Jeff Sessions and all of this. And now that it's out and we're, gosh, towards the end of the first term for 45, that's about all I can say about him. Um <laughs> It's still relevant, you know. We're still, we're, still, we're still talking about that stuff. So, and and then you don't cut, you don't pull any punches when it comes to a little bit of language too. <laughs> yes. Um, so I have to say that uh, some things that people don't know about me, you know, my father is a minister, and so it was really I I towed the line on how far I could like push right the without like totally upsetting my parents. You know. <laughs> so well, I love the way you had shh, yeah. dash dash. <laughs> I love it. But we knew what you're talking about. We get it. We get it. You know, and I think Jesus understands. He he understands. And sometimes you have to use strong language. I think he understands too. Yes, he absolutely yeah. does. I always say, I, I worship the Jesus that flipped tables. Yes. Right, that's right. Absolutely. I, I know too. <laughs> Let's dig into the book a little bit. Um, well, before we do, that you know what? It's been couched as the lean in for women of color. And that's interesting in that you know of course that came first the lean in book and of course after that the women in the workplace study which was leanin.org so you know yeah they made some headway when it came to actually addressing women of color at least in the data but we missed that book so we were I say we missed it meaning we were not in it Michelle Obama even said look this wasn't even for us so your book is supposed to kind of be the answer to that problem or at least fill that gap how does that make you feel because I mean we see Cheryl Sandberg God bless her she's out there doing some work you know Mm -hmm. and some good work for women um, primarily white women but you know she has at least acknowledged that we're out there and we have our our problems too Um, Mm -hmm. but recently you know she said some things that kind of sounds like she might have heard of your book or maybe and you know it's been kind of an out of body. I follow you on Twitter. So this whole conversation cropped up where she made some statements and it's like, well, hello. How did you feel about that? You know, I, so I'll say this, and this is an exclusive for, for the culture soup listeners is that in two weeks, I'm actually going to Facebook and yeah. So I don't know, I'm going there to teach a workshop, but, and then the next day I'm going to have lunch at leanin.org. Now it's not been said that Miss Sandberg will be in attendance in either one of those, but they are aware of of the book. <laughs> okay, well we know they have to be. <laughs> yes, because so, the whole corporate communications team is the same corporate communications team. <laughs> and by the way, I have some friends that are having corporate communications in Facebook. If you're listening, it'd be great if Miss Sandberg swung by Minda's workshop. So you've heard it here first. <laughs> yes, so, great. You know, it would have been cool for me if she, in that last article that she wrote where she addressed, you know, black women and women of color, if she would have maybe said something about the memo Mm -hmm. or talked about, you know, resources that were catered to them. But I'm just going to say, I thank her for the book that she wrote because had she not written it, I wouldn't have been inspired to write my own version of Mm -hmm. it. And so for us, I hope that the success of the memo will open up more doors so that women like you, me, and others will be able to write these stories, right? Because if you look on the Amazon list, there's tons of white women that are writing career books. And there's like a few of us that even make a blurb there. And so I think we need the same recognition, uh, just like the others, you know, because we're doing the work as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Now for the book. So there are (laughs) a few different chapters that got my attention. One that I want to talk about for sure is the one that raises issues of names. 
And <laughs> you know what? This may be something that's very invisible to people who are not of color, who may be of color and maybe have European names. Maybe they've never thought of it this way. I have a different take on it because I've actually had some name issues myself. And I have a very plain Jane name, but my name, my middle name is Michelle. My first name is Leticia. And to make sure that I don't get confused with all the other Michelle Smiths out there, I use the L period in front of my name. It's amazing how many people just want to just overlook that. And, you know, I've gotten vibes from people that are like, okay, well, she's saying L Michelle, who does she think she is, is the tone of the questioning. Like, we can't win for losing. If you're Coquisha, they got a problem with that too. So yeah. talk about what you got in the book. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you said that because to some, they may not even see that this is an issue, but you have to realize like my government name is Yasminda, but I haven't been able to go by Yasminda probably since I was, you know, uh, almost two to three years old because going into grade school, going into high school, going into college, my professors would automatically or teachers would look at it and the Y just automatically like scared them away, didn't even wow. try. Uh, and so I realized at a young age to say, oh, it's Yasminda, but you can call me Minda. And that sat well. And they, you could see the relief on their ah, face. Minda. And, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so relieved. <laughs> I can do that. I can do Minda. Yeah, you know, and so you learn, I think as Black women, we learn to make concessions for things. And you don't realize, at least I didn't until much later, at whose expense was I making these concessions for, right? And so when someone does call me Yasminda, I'm like, who are they? Who are they talking about? Because right. I don't. It's almost like I don't even know who that person is. But uh, one of the things that I will say, I want us to realize that if we, the next generation, if you want to use Lakeisha, Bonnie, whatever it is you want to be called, yes, people can say Dikembe Mutumbo. Yes. They can say whatever it is they want to say. Totally. So they, we have to condition them. And so um, as I've been going across the country, the one thing that most college students will ask me, can I use my real name when I get to corporate America? Right. And it hurts my heart that 18 and 19 year olds, 20 year olds are thinking about their name. They haven't even thinking about what the job they're going to do yeah. when they're there. They're thinking about those things. So I think our colleagues really need to be aware of some of the issues that the challenges that we c come up against before we even walk in the door. Well, and don't you think that's generational? So those yeah. college kids have parents that warn them if you have too many black indicators indicators on your resume, you know, take that sorority off, you know, don't, don't, don't highlight your NAACP chapter, you know, and oh, your name, use your middle name, not your first name. You know, all of this good stuff. Our parents went through some stuff that we can't even imagine. So, you know, generation over generation is kind of just play it down, blend in. And mm -hmm. everything will be okay. Cross your fingers and pray to Jesus. Right. Yeah. And so now this is different. Now we have more chief diversity officers than we've ever had before. We have lots of company companies either doing diversity inclusion, right? Or just doing it because they're checking a box. Either way, you have more people being intentional about saying, we want to know what your race or your ethnicity might be so that we can make sure we're being inclusive in our workforce. But that's a double-edged sword. Well, it is. And and I, I could probably say, at least when I enter the workforce, and I would imagine you probably experience the same, is that we didn't have uh, blind interview processes. <laughs> you know, right. Those were not necessarily there. And so you did have to make those decisions. And, um, and even when we get in the door, I would also say that, you know, don't question why you're there. You're there. Right. Do your thing. Right. You know? So. Totally. You know, um, the first university that I received a full ride scholarship to um, by, by mail, got the letter. Congratulations. Four years covered. Woohoo! Showed up when it's time to regist register at the registrar, brought my letter, put it there. And they said, oh, one moment. They went back to the back. They came back. We think there must have been a mistake. Really? What kind of mistake are we talking about? Well, we don't have a full ride scholarship for you. Well, it says congratulations, four years. That's my name. But apparently I look white on paper. Mm. Yeah. I didn't go to that university, which is why I shot down the freeway to TCU and have been, you know, touting TCU ever since because they took me at the last minute. But... It's a catch-22. 
Mm-hmm. Either you look really black on paper or you look white and you show up and you shock them. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly, right? I mean, I, back then you used to do like, you know, and you still do them now, but phone interviews yes. and people would, my dad would always joke and say, you sound white. That's great. You know, and then you go yeah. into the, the office and they're like, oh, I didn't expect. Right. You, you, you yeah. see it. Oh. <laughs> and, and the signals that that sends to us just being an interviewee, right? And right. now we have to say, oh, well, now I have to get them to like me because they're already thinking all these other things. And I think it's a lot of mental gymnastics that some of our counterparts will never have to endure and they need to understand what it's like for for many of us. So you bring up a very good point. While we talked about your audience being primarily sisters, maybe (laughs) millennials, you know, but it's resonating with so many other people. Let's talk about why this is important for everybody to know about and read about. Yeah, so it's interesting because I think I was recently at a conference and I was off to the side kind of watching who picked up the books and who didn't pick up the books. And it was a primarily white women conference that I was speaking at. And I noticed that pretty much every, and I stuck around for about an hour and watched this. And my last, my case study was only three women of color picked up the memo Mm -hmm. and white women just passed by it because I think our unconscious bias says that that book is not for me, right? It says women of color on it. It has a black woman on the cover. You would say that's not for me. But I say, yes, it's every much for you as it is for us, because how do you, how can you be a good ally? How can you be a good colleague if you don't know what it's like for me to modify my name? Or you don't know what it's like for me when I, last night, you know, the Trayvon Martins were murdered and now I come into the office. Like you need to understand what it's like when, when the manager says you people love your bright colors. Like these are the things you need to be aware of yeah. and you need these books so right. that you know tell that how. story. So everybody knows what you're talking about. Cause you just posted this on Instagram and I was like, what time capsule was this man flying in on? You want to tell the story? Yes. Really quick is when I first started in corporate America, I had a manager and he would say all kinds of crazy things, but it wasn't something I was ready for. No one had given me the memo that this would be the kind of stuff I'd be up against. And I came into a city, I was a consultant and I picked up him and a colleague uh, from the airport because I got there a day early. And so he got in the car and he commented on my nail color. I had burnt orange nail polish and he said, oh, you people love your bright colors. And then he jokes with my other white nail colleague about for 15 minutes, mind you, about how black people love bright colors. Wow, you know, like, is his name Archie Bunker? Because that's exactly what Archie Bunker would say on the Norman Lear show back Mm -hmm. in the, what, 70s, 80s? And Meathead would correct him. <laughs> well, the one in the back seat did not correct him. He, you know, laughed too. And I I didn't know what to say. I didn't know if I could say anything. And I didn't, you know, you how we do sometimes. We just kind of fake laugh and we push forward because that's what sometimes we have to do. But we shouldn't have to do that. And bad behavior. He, I went on to work for him for many years and he would say those things all the time. And I settled into that, El Michelle. And I shouldn't have. And I don't want us to be able to do that. But the most important thing is the reason why I tell that story and I wrote about it in the book is that what if that colleague in the backseat would have been an ally, would have stepped in, would have cut in and said, you know what, we don't do that here. Or asked me, you know, Minda, sorry that went down that way, blah, blah, blah. Those are the things that we need people to step up and read these experiences. Right. You know, and there was another story you told in Twitter um, and it sounded like it took you a little bit of time to even come to the conclusion that you share. And I understand why, but you had an experience in the airport and it spurred a whole conversation about allies. And we talked a little bit about what an accomplice really should be, because there are some folks that think, oh, yeah, I'm an ally. But they think that's a passive position. I know better, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't necessarily mean I need to chime in and do better. So what happened to you? Yeah, I was actually it was during the holidays and I was very skeptical about talking about it because I didn't want to put it out there, but I thought it could be a teachable moment. And a very long story short, I was on one of those walkways at the O'Hare airport. And you right. know, on one side, you can stand and right. the people the movers. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and normally, normally, I am the people mover, but I had, you know, I was tired. I was just like, let me just stand here and catch my breath. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, I felt this bag baggage rum up behind me. Wow. And I turn around and this guy 
uh, who happens to be a white male, he was ramming his luggage behind me. And then he says, move out of the way. And he continued to do that. And then once I told him that, you know, you can go around me, that's what that area is mm-hmm. for. Uh, he got in my face. And um, for those of you who have never met me, I am five feet on a good She's day. small, people. <laughs> you know, 120-ish pounds. And, you know, he was much bigger. He had two luggage. And so then he blocked both sides of the walkway, people were behind us. So yeah. nobody could get out. And so he called me names. He called me some racial slurs. Uh, I was actually on the telephone when he did this. And I told myself in that moment that I was not going to move. Yeah. Right. He was like, move out of the way. And he continued to be aggressive even until we got off the walkway. I told the police, uh, I got off the walkway. I turned the corner. I saw about five police officers. I figured I should tell them because he had, you know, assaulted me verbally right. but then with his suitcases and they told me there's nothing they could do because he didn't physically put his hands on me wow. and it was a lot and I on Twitter we were having this really in-depth conversation mm-hmm. because I said where are all these so-called allies I had about 10 people behind me when this was happening and nobody did anything intervened even asked me if I was okay wow And, you know, you just got to ask yourself why. You know, there are a million reasons why people don't get involved when even there's crime going on. They say they just don't want to be a part of that. They don't want to get in the mix. You know, they don't know what's really going on. But this was clear. It was clear. It was super clear. Goodness. So do you think this is a heart issue? White people do what they do. Like like the guy with the luggage that's pushing you. Yeah, you know... Obviously, he's angry at the world, right? And he had every right to be upset for whatever he... But what he didn't have the right to be is to attack me and racial slur me. That's a different thing, right? I think that it is our responsibility to stick up for people or at least de-escalate the situation. There's no way that I would have been behind a woman and a man doing this to her and not done something, said something, try to de-escalate the situation. And so we have all these people who tell us every day we're an ally. We're an ally. They wear the pins, but never put any skin in the game. Don't right. do anything. I mean, there are those who do, right? But oh, I think totally you can't stand in silence any longer. And that's in the workplace and that's in real life. Right. Cause you know what? People like, let's let's call him Bill. <laughs> Bill with the <laughs> luggage. People like Bill go to a workplace somewhere. And I'm sure his workplace has not just an EEOC statement, but they probably mm-hmm. have a diversity and inclusion program. Yeah. And Bill, the luggage guy, still thinks the way he thinks. Yeah. And, and Bill would have been fired, probably. The things that he said to me, mm-hmm. I told the EEOC or I told the HR, I would imagine he would have been fired. And that, and he went to his job, right, working alongside probably a couple of us. Right. 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 <laughs> yeah. Really, really sad. So tell me your story, Minda. W- what's your background? Where are you from? And tell us about you. Yes, yes. I, I, I am more than the walkway. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Twitter. <laughs> uh, but I grew up in half in Southern California outside of Los Angeles and the other half uh, as a teenager in Illinois <clears throat> outside of Chicago. And so um, once I got out of college, a uh, master's degree, undergrad communications business, and I worked as a fundraising consultant and I would live in different cities um, from Las Vegas to Austin, Texas, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to Raleigh, North Carolina. And I did that for about 15 years before I launched into uh, career development for women of color. And if you would have asked me even five years ago, 10 years ago, what I'd be doing today, I never would have imagined writing a book. I never would have imagined starting my own company. Uh, but when you find your your voice, I guess it was all, always there, but yeah. I had reason to activate it. Uh, you realize that you can't put the genie back in the box. <laughs> no, that genie won't go back. <laughs> won't go back. Will not go back. <laughs> yes, and I love rap rap music, um, and that was one of the reasons that uh, r- made the memo really fun to write because I love all things pop culture, and so I was able to put my personality in that book as well. Excellent, excellent. And what is the origin of Yasminda? Yes, so uh, my... Father's mother is from England, and um, she named her first daughter. My um, biological father is one of 12 kids, and uh, it, it derives from Egypt. Okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> so that's where Yasminda comes from. Wow. So, so do you have Egyptian roots? 
Um, so no, which is uh, the odd thing, but that's just a, a name that she uh, chose. And so my mom really thought it was really pretty. And, and I still do think it's pretty. Even yeah. though I, I, only I get that. that. <clears throat> the L in my name stands for Leticia, which is mm-hmm. very Hispanic. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not Latina. Not one bit. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. But listen, um, I was teasing. Why don't we start calling you Yasminda? I, I mean, I want to now. Yeah, you can. You know, it's it's funny. Uh, some of my um, college friends, they'll call me Yaz, you know, for fun. Uh, but mostly everybody calls me Minda. But I but let me tell you, I signed those checks. Yes, Minda. Okay. Uh, all the time. <laughs> Give me my coins. Yes, Minda means her coins. <laughs> Look, you know, our Latino friends, they understand this, too. I know at least two people that call themselves George. They're over 40 years old. And, you know, they've been introduced to me that way. And at some point I'll say, isn't your name Jorge? And then they start grinning and they're like, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And then I'm like, shouldn't I call you that? And I want to honor their heritage Mm -hmm. and call them their names because I understand what it's like to have your name slided, even if it's just an L, period. Yes. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. So what are you working on now? Yeah, so thanks for asking. Uh, Well, I'm back in the classroom this semester at NYU. And so I I teach um, a course there called Talent Development. And so I'm working on that, but I'm also- uh, Did they turn up in droves? I'm sorry? Did they turn up in droves this time? (laughs) This class (laughs) did. Yes. (laughs) This time time people, we didn't didn't have to um, do any fire alarms to get people to the class. Um, But, and I'm also pitching two new- book projects. And so, um, and I'm hoping that, uh, again, a a writer's retreat that I'm working on for later this year, because I want, as you mentioned before, black women getting book deals is a little harder for some of, for some of us. And I want to make sure that we have the tools and the resources to be able to, to secure our seat at the publishing table. Talk to me about that because you know, um, and, and the route I'm taking is the traditional publisher, get the agent, get some big house out of New York to represent you or publish your book. A lot of people are self-publishing and no shade to that. You know Mm -hmm. what? You can do it fast. You can get on Amazon. It has credibility, all of that good stuff. But what are the benefits of going through the traditional publishing machine, if you will? Yeah. um, So because I went through the machine, I'm very happy that I did, but my, I, so I did get an agent and she represented me and um, shout out to Monica Odom. She is one of, she's a black woman and one of the few uh, agents in the, in um, the literary world uh, by a major publisher, but she understood the importance of a book like this. And I think that finding an agent in which is going to back you and push you totally and agree. on your behalf and who gets it, mm-hmm. uh, so she pitched the book to four out of five major publishing houses and four of them said there's no audience for a book like this. It would never sell. I'm not famous. Mm-hmm. You know, um, we don't need this book. There's plenty of there's lean in. Right. That right. Was what we were told. <laughs> so uh, the fifth one has They said, yes, they had an imprint or they have an imprint called Seal Press. And so they said, you know what? I guess there is a gap for this. We hadn't considered it. Right. Uh, again, when you when you don't have those diverse faces and voices, they will tell you that your content isn't needed because that's not their experience. And so I'm happy to have the machine because I think that a book like this needed that big machine because it would have been really hard and it would have fell through the cracks had I self published it. Um, And so to have that credibility and that's what I want to see more. Like, again, I think that self publishing, maybe one day I might self publish. Yeah. You know, and people do. And it's yeah. fine. I think um, fine. Valerie I think Burton, who's a good that. friend of mine, she mm-hmm. started out, she self-published her first book with the idea that a house would pick it up um, later and Random House did. And she's done, I think, 14 books now. She's on her 14th one. Yeah. And sometimes she had an agent. Sometimes she didn't. Sometimes she went through a house. Sometimes she didn't. And sometimes there's no one formula. Yeah, there's no one formula. I've talked to other, you know, best-selling authors and you work the same. I, I felt like at times I was, uh, I had the imprint behind me, but to be completely honest, I felt like I was selling CDs out the back of the trunk yeah. because you are on the, you know what I mean? Right, right. I mean, sometimes you are the marketing machine. You are the marketing machine. Mm-hmm. And so 
I'm thankful for what they did uh, bring to the project, but you really are your your best advocate. And so, uh, but there are these rules of engagement, right? Yeah. And now going back to the publisher for a second book, it makes it a little bit easier having right. that credibility. Mm-hmm, and um, mm-hmm. So I think there is some value to going the traditional route. And I'll say this to your, I just received an email not too long ago from my publisher saying that 2019 was one of the best years for publishing. Uh, so wow, that's new. That, yeah, that that's new, that that was something skyrocketed with books. So let me tell you, the publish, publishing is not dead. That's good. <laughs> and you know, a little secret I was told, um, you know, even if you don't have the blue check mark, because some people think, okay, I don't want to go this route. I don't have a blue check mark. I don't have millions and millions of followers. If you're a talented speaker, if you're a PR person, if you know communications, if you know marketing, you have a leg up from other just plain writers. And there's some really great writers that don't have a mind for marketing or don't have the ability to have a platform all their own. And can yeah. you speak to that? Oh, absolutely. I, I decided that I was going to pick one platform, mm-hmm. or one and a half that I would really try to shine right uh, on. And Twitter was that place yeah. uh, because I didn't have the blue check mark. I didn't have a lot of followers. Even when I got signed for my book deal, I think I had maybe 2000 followers. Mm-hmm. at the time, Right. You know, and, <clears throat> and so not that that's little or a lot, but I just wasn't on the blurb like some other people, right? But they were engaged. That's the difference. Yeah. And so that's the difference. So now, you know, you look at my follower, I have an engaging conversation and that's what I did. I said, you know what? I don't have the money to hire an external PR person. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be myself and engage and And be consistent. And And you do that on LinkedIn, find Mm -hmm. that platform (laughs) that you can rock on and the, you, as they say, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> yes. But you got to stick with it. I think a lot of people get discouraged when they think, okay, I've done this. I've put something out there. The vanity metrics don't look great. Okay, I'll quit. No, do not quit. Keep doing it. Because you got to be known for that one thing. No, and let me tell you, when all of the press, and I've had some really great press on this, um, on this book, it wasn't because my publisher pitched to them. Right. It was strictly off of the engagement. People who saw that this book is coming yes. out and they reached out and said, Hey, I work at time, you know, or I work here and right. we want to put you on. And so you never know who's watching, you who's engaging. You just never know. Absolutely. And you got to stay top of mind. Yeah. Minda, this has been awesome. I really appreciate you coming on. Where can we find you online? You're on Twitter and Instagram. Yeah. Yes. Um, find, go to MindaHearts.com. All of my information is there and you can find me on the internet streets. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. And best wishes to you moving forward. And if there's ever any way that I can support you, you just let me know. You already are. So thank you. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Minda. I'm going to turn off the recorder. Where is it? I'm in full screen here. Oops, I took a picture. <laughs> Okay, it's exit full screen. All right, where's my recording? The Culture Soup Podcast is a production of No Size Communication, LLC.